Thank you for the invitation. Um, first, I thank you really for the invitation once again because uh, I think it's a very important uh, exchange uh, in a transnational way. And the uh, second thing I want to say is that I really regret to not speak, being able to speak uh, because um, yesterday and today I really had the feeling that uh, I would like to join your discussion. Uh, this portion I got, uh, I, I really was uh, a bit not nervous, but uh, I had uh, the idea to, do, to join because there are very similar debates, uh, uh, I think, in Germany and uh, in, uh, let's say, I say oftentimes exodus labor. I don't know if, you, if it's okay for you to use this term. Anyhow, I changed my slides because um, yesterday and also today, um, as far as I got it, uh, you often use this idea of Germany as a developed country. And uh, so I changed some slides. I really pr would prefer that we have a joint debate about the political outcome, about the political perspective. And my topic, I have some ideas about that too, I mean I can tell them of course, but my topic will be more really to debate that German model, that famous German model, my impression was you all have in mind, or some of you have in mind, and many people in Europe, even Germans, have in mind. And so my topic here is uh, precarization and fragmentation in Germany, and which belongs together to Europe and, and the globalization topic and Europe. You presented me, so I can make it brief. Germany, as you know and as you discuss, and as we discuss it also in Germany, is something like a symbol of economic and social wealth. Um, it is a symbol of gaining both. Uh, via hard good work, you can have both good working conditions and economic strength. This is, I would guess, the idea behind that good German model. And Germany in that manner seems to prove that in Europe, at least, at least in Europe, there is an existing model of economic and social wealth. Let's say an existing model of functioning capitalism, to put it like that. And other countries would like to join would like to follow. And by adapting the same measurements and means we adapted in Germany. By the way, when I talk about us or we in Germany, um, I cannot stretch the topic of migration here, but the German population is not that tough German population, of course. I mean, we have the whole topic about migrant workforce, transnationalization, and so on. So these categories of us as Germans and yours of, as ex service laden and so on, they are abstract applications and we use it to, to make things clear. But the idea, and as far as I got it in yesterday's debates in the evening, the idea also in your country, Serbia and beyond, but also in other, many other countries like Spain, like Poland, even like France, the idea is to adapt German social and economic model, and I want to question that, and I want to inform you from my point of view a bit uh, what to think about that, and uh, to, I would say, open another perspective. So, the good German model had its crisis too in 2008, this famous financial crisis, you see it here. The, um, uh, the, the specifics here are not so important, but what is important and what you know, Germany retook economic wealth or economic growth, let's say, not about. Um, the success story, and I think you know that too, this is just to start some, some images, the success story is above all a success of export industry. These data here, it is not about the details, but just to have an impression, these data here are not export data, but the overwhelming export compared with import. 
So this is why Germany has a kind of critics right now from the EU arguing that there's an imbalance, and you can see it here. Germany exports much more, even increasing all the time, than importing. Um, so we call ourselves in Germany export champions. I don't know if you know that, but it's a famous term. It's a famous uh, common ex uh, expression. So, so the question of my talk here will be what kind of success is this, what kind of models behind? And my thesis is, and I'm very thankful that you discussed this already yesterday very in detail as far as I got it, that there's an ongoing fiction, an image, but a fictive image of an inclusive, let's say, Fordist model, model of relatively homogeneous welfare system, including social insurances, relatively equal pay, equal pay not in the gender dimension, because there has always been these differences, but equal pay in the dimension of branches, of suppliers and uh, mark, um, uh, uh, um, what do you say, core uh, um, enterprises. So there's this, this uh, uh, relative homogeneous society we are all coming from, I mean, also in excellence level, you know this a bit, that the social situation maybe was not good, but it not, was not that divided as it is today. The rich were not that rich, and the poor were not that poor, to put it simply. So there's an ongoing fiction of a forest model, ongoing fiction in the official ideology, and I would put here the thesis that instead we have to acknowledge and we have to see in detail that there's a mode of economic growth developing which relies on social fragmentation, differentiation, polarization. These frictions, these, uh, these polarization, fragmentations and so, they are not uh, a mean to get wealth for anybody, but they are the ruling uh, models as such. This we find in whole Europe and in Germany as well. So the agenda to prove that in a, in a certain manner to you is for me here to speak in three steps, uh, kind of examples to, to illustrate that thesis I have. Uh, the first is to talk about what we call deindustrialization, which is above all a deindustrialization of the former German Democratic Republic. I don't know if you are a bit familiar with that idea of unification and breaking of the wall after uh, 90, 1990. No, it was 1989, by the way. <laughs> the second point is um, to look at, because we, we have to, I mean, we all speak about nations, we do not speak enough about transnational corporations and transnational capital. And so I will briefly do that, uh, to speak about transnational corporations in the process of reopenization, and in Germany and beyond. And the third point is um, to, to, to give you some information how this transformation what we observe also in different countries in Europe and beyond, for what we call in science uh, from welfare state to workfare state. I don't know if you had this debate too, I could not uh, say that, and I could not follow it. And so we have it in Germany too, and those three points are linked together, together. And I will not speak about the whole system of Germany, the whole model, I do not speak about migration, I do not speak about many things, but about those three topics and then we go on in the deep discussion. So first point, the deindustrialization of the former GDR. Um, very quick after what we call the breakdown of the wall, um, took a, a, a very quick privatization and we call it liquidation of industry took place. When I talk about liquidation, this is not a term which is used by a marginalized left, but it's an official term because the processes were dramatic. Uh, in a special agency called Treuhandanstalt, this is a German word, so a special state agency took 
9,000 9, enterprises and the task was to sell them as quick as possible. They closed um, 3,500. Uh, among of them, I think when you are from Exodus Label, you know a bit about what I'm talking. Uh, we call it combinates, so really huge factories. So when we have the number of 3,500, um, today it would be maybe uh, 7,000 or 10,000 enterprises. Some of them, and not uh, less, uh, were sold for symbolic price, which was one D mark at this time, which would be today half a euro, to give you an impression. And in that process, and this was of course um, the idea also behind to, to reduce workforce, a dramatic reduction of employment took place very, very quick. All, already in the first half year, you do not see it in the figure, but already in the first half year you have a reduction of the workforce of 20%. I speak only about East Germany now, yeah? You are right. Um, then how we see it here in between 90, no, um, 89 and 91, 30%, and in the following years you have uh, a reduction of the workforce of 50%. The most dramatic was an industry where you have the official, with the official data of 85% of reduction of the workforce. So this is what took place in East Germany, and we call it deindustrialization. Um, of course, unemployment rate rose dramatically. Uh, it came up to be 30, 25, 30%. But it was not that high because, as you see here, 2 million people uh, left to West Germany. Uh, and still now, every week, every day, it depends where you live, 1 million uh, people change because they live not there where they work, so they change. Since that debate, since that time, we have in science and in the political debate uh, questions like abandoned regions. So there are whole regions, especially in the northeast of Germany, which is former GDR, but now the northeast of Germany, which are, we say, abandoned. abandoned. So this is a term of the geographic uh, science debate. Uh, also in uh, um, geographics, um, people talk about shrinking, shrinking cities, so cities are diminishing. Um, as you can imagine, it is about, um, first of all, it is young people uh, who are leaving. And we talk about also about social and regional exclusion. So this is the first topic to say that um, when we talk about the German model, um, at least there is one point to be questioned. What is important to know is that this deindustrialization was in a certain manner moderated via unions. Um, in a very important step, unions, I have to say, which came from West Germany, because the former, we, we call it uh, uh, following Lenin and so on, the transformation of the uh, transforming unions, you know, we take the line of the party and put it in the factories. This was the idea of the union. So uh, it was discredited, because discredited, discredited, of course. So there were many, uh, um, some strikes also, but many protestations and manifestations against this kind of union. And so it collapsed, uh, this official socialist union in the former East Germany. And now the West German unions took the place and became very uh, huge once again. Uh, but they made some one thing which is the separation of the collective bargaining region in East and West, arguing that as the East is not as productive as the West, we have to be careful with rising wages. This was the argument of the Union. So the, we had for a long time, it uh, just finished uh, two, uh, one and a half years ago, we had two separated collective bargaining structures. And indeed, the wages 
um, have been or were in the beginning very different, more or less one third in the beginning, even lower, this is the official uh, um, uh, data. And today there is still a difference of something like 20%. The argument for that was, as I said, to catch up with productivity. And the general argument, and as far as I got it yesterday, this is also what you hear uh, in Exodus Labia. Many countries, as also Greece, for example, have this debate. In our debate, the term was, we have to go through a valley of tears. Very nice. <laughs> And we have to go through this valley of tears means that, okay, there will be a time where maybe not all things are so easy, but after then we will join this wealth and economic growing model because first we have to adapt our economic um, structure uh, on that uh, Western model. It was the famous Kanzler I think you are all a bit young here, but uh, the famous, not all, but some of you are very young, uh, the famous Chancellor Kohl, who promised um, a very uh, landscape, how to say, a blue in the um, landscape with flowers like that, yeah? you know, with very somehow um, agreeable landscapes, and this um, bon mot, as you can say in French, really uh, pursued him, so he, uh, he was a bit uh, trapped in that uh, formulation. So, what, because, I, I, I underline that, because what was promised did not take place. This is the message. There was no homogenization, no adjustment, no general national inclusion of the former Eastern population into the Western model. But instead, we observed very quick that Western German and also American and others, but Western enterprises used this sharp social differences. I only spoke about wages, there have been many other differences like working hours and so on. Taxes, as I said here, so the state tried to, to attract capital via good taxes and so. I think you heard this debate here a bit too. Mm. So they used these differences for their restructuring and to strengthen their productivity and cost advantages and advantages. One famous example is Volkswagen in Sickau. This is a town, Sickau, in East Germany. Another very famous example is Opel Eisenach. Opel, you know, is GM. But there are many, many others. And uh, what they did, as you see it here, they combined very modern production structures, high productivity, very modern plans with low wages. So in, in our debate uh, in this time, we spoke about Opel Eisenach, which is the second example I gave, to be something like an example, to be something like an experimental field for um, uh, enterprises especially in Opel Eisenach, the famous lean production was pushed through. So this means very, very flexible working time, working in teams, competing to each other, outsourcing to suppliers. This was pushed through in Opel Eisenach because they couldn't do here because of high unemployment, um, the expectation to, the need to have jobs and so on. And so they used these East German sites as um, experimental fields. And, as I said, East Germany became a pioneer of lean production in this specific uh, cases of the automotive industry. But it is, became also, what I did not mention here, a pioneer of precarious, flexible workforce and so on, in all um, visions you can imagine. So, East Germany became and still is uh, in a certain manner, but without the changing, maybe we can talk in the debate, but still is an internal periphery with, as I said, cheap labor, sharp, what well, I did not mention yet, sharp decline of union power, still high unemployment. 
sharp decline of union power means that um, employers evaded the more and more the collective bargaining system. This took place first in East Germany too. I did not speak so much about that, but just to mention it. So to sum up, this was the first pound, point. When we, and I come to the second, as you see, um, when we talk about Volkswagen and General Motors, um, as you all know, I think, we talk about transnational corporations. And what is important here, and really, when I listened to your, to your lecture today and yesterday, I really thought that we have to talk more about the economic system we face today. I think we should talk more about political economy, not in, as capitalism in general, but as it is presented today. So I can make it only brief here, but um, changing from integrated mass production enterprise, one big enterprise which produces all, to a lean, flexible production network in post fordism is an international process. This changing of internationality uh, in science, we distinguish between multinational enterprises and transnational enterprises. Multinational enterprises, for example Volkswagen once, once again in the 60s, opened plants in Brazil, in South Africa and other countries, but it was not, as it is today, a whole flexibilization of the organization of the enterprise as a, as a whole. Today, we have sites, for example, the Volkswagen supplier for motors in Hungary, or the, um, the um, plant of uh, GM Opel in Gliwice, Poland, which have special tasks for the enterprise, and they are built up there for their special task, and they compete all the time in their function to be a certain supplier with such special functions and so on, with other um, suppliers as well as uh, in that region, but also transnational. I will come to up that later. So what we do have in post-Fordist times is a sharp competition um, in a tight and contingent world market. Since the 70s, we speak about a new division of labor. This is exactly what I'm, I was talking about, arguing that for special functions, we have special regions who can fulfill these functions. This is the idea of uh, the term of the new division of labor. And um, we have a huge process of outsourcing of production, but also services, uh, research and development. Um, and this outsourcing is, I underline it once again, an international process. We have it in all branches. I can really say that. I mean, there's really no branch which is not, which is not transnationally organized. Um, I personally worked about electronics, automotive, and food a bit. Um, just to mention food, because this is impressive too, just in the last uh, couple of years, there are Danish uh, enterprises who invest a lot in the former GDR region to start mass production of meat here, and they use, once again, the very cheap labor of East Germany. So there also you have transnational production chains. And the logic of these transnational production chains, chains, chains <laughs> um, is to combine special economic and social advantages, or to put, differ to put it differently, to combine differences in social um, status, social situation of labor worldwide. So they use differences such as wages, of course, but also union rights, as you all know, I think. Um, a big problem or a big topic was the working time uh, flexibility. They use also, um, we say, we talk about gifts because uh, uh, those tax reduces, because many governments really 
present uh, or make it like presents or they make it like gifts. They, the enterprises do not have to pay any taxes at all. So, for instance, just to give one example, is the electronic industry. It was Great Britain who started up with a very sharp competition of tax reduction, and then we see a lot of investment in electronic industry in Great Britain. In the mid of the 90s, this competition was won by countries of former Eastern Europe, such as Poland, Hungary, um, and Romania. And I repeat that the model of production we find here is not the low-end production which some uh, stinky and not qualified labor force and in dark um, uh, plants, no. This modern uh, production organization in modern plants, but combined with low wages. In East Germany, uh, not Eastern Europe and Poland, for instance, uh, I have been there in, as a researcher. Uh, we have very high degrees of agency work first, part-time, precarious work first, and we have low level of wages. And all that, and the really, really newest um, machines, newest equipment of production. So what is taking place uh, in, our, in our debate uh, at the institute where I, I am working at, we spoke about a technological development in the debate, in the scientific debate, this is called upgrading. But there's no social upgrading, or at least for some. You already mentioned this um, aristocracy, aristocracy of workforce, which is, I would guess, um, nearly all the time important to have some political um, stability. So you need, most, in most cases, you need at least some people who have a better position. There's no social upgrading, and there's no regional upgrading. And, uh, what we are talking about instead is what we see is cathedrals in the desert. I don't know if you know this expression. Um, this means that you have, as I said, modern plants uh, as a part of a worldwide net of production, modern production, but around there is, as this picture says, desert. So there is no development of economy and no social development. Instead, some very small enterprises, black uh, market people, and so on. And um, this means that the whole idea, and I think this is your discussion too, the whole idea to attract foreign capital to invest in a, in a modern way, which takes place, as I said. And the idea behind is that due to this investment, we have the cluster building. So we have some spillover effects, it is called in the debate, some uh, trickling through and uh, going into the region. And so the whole region and the whole country, uh, finally, will uh, grow up and become something like a strong economy, a strong social uh, nation, and so on. But this does not take place. Because, as, as I mentioned, the supply chains are transnational, international, first point. Second point, because the welfare states, or the former welfare states, we have to say, are really competing against each other. So they really have no uh, demands um, in front of those enterprises. They give all um, taxes, infrastructure, and well-qualified people to the enterprises. And so there's no no link any longer to um, some social um, uh, equality uh, demands in that region. And so we have no regional development of infrastructure supplies and so on. But uh, in the countries I mentioned, Poland, Hungary, Romania, uh, we talk about dual economy. Somebody mentioned that term already today. Dual economy or fragmented economy saying that we have those modern plants transnationally linked and the other side um, of the economy. Anyhow, these modern sites of production still are in a permanent competition to get capital, to attract more capital, or to keep production. 
also in East, Eastern Europe, we have all the time the threat to clo of closures, to relocate to Russia, to relocate to the Ukraine, but also to relocate from West Hungary to East Hungary. And this is not, I really underline that, it is not just an ideology of the management, but this takes place. One famous example we had in our, um, in our research was uh, the Xbox, when this Microsoft thing was new, and an IBM uh, plant in uh, Hungary, in Szekesferva. And they took all the tax reduction, they took all the money the state gave them, and there was a big um, festivity when the plant was open. And nine months later, it closed and went uh, uh, to China in this case. So there's a whole competition between national systems of, um, of uh, labor rights, wages, and so on. Management is all the time arguing that Hungary uh, have better, more flexible um, uh, possibilities than Poland, for instance. They are arguing, of course, against unions in Poland, uh, saying that if you go on here with a strike, you have to relocate to Hungary. As I said, there's a competition with the same arguments all the time uh, from West to East Hungary and so on. So, um, no, sorry, first of all, there's a national competition, and, but also a regional and a local social uh, competitions, competition, because um, the reloca relocation question is not only one between nations, but also, as I mentioned with the Hungarian case, within nations. West and East Hungary, but also in via creation of special economic zones. We have special economic zones in Poland, for instance, and for one investment of a famous supplier of uh, mobile phones and so on, um, there were uh, four, no, six special economic zones who applied for the investment of this uh, investor, this, of this supplier. So they competed against each other that the investor comes to them and not to the neighborhood. So this competition is also inside of one nation. For instance, in Poland with the special economic zones. We have also special economic zones in, in, in Hungary and so. Um, this competition takes place, as I mentioned, uh, in a German case with that internal periphery. But there's also competition between cities. Uh, we have this in Germany. The most um, cases of relocation actually is not supranational relocation, but uh, within one nation. We have that in Germany. Many, many investors change, for, ins for instance, in Berlin and go to the periphery of Berlin because there they pay lower taxes. And so there's a whole competition system uh, with the idea that transnational corporations use the smallest difference to have an advantage in worldwide competition uh, for their profits, of course. So, to make the point here for the second point, instead of, ha if, of achieving a uh, homogeneous national social economic model, we have social competition, as I said, in Europe and beyond. Uh, I cannot speak much about that, but the whole competition in Europe, of course, takes place uh, in the frame of a competing with China. Um, the whole electronic industry which was built up, or not the whole, but a big portion of the electronic industry which was built up in Poland, under these circumstances uh, uh, I was talking about, went to China. And this China uh, uh, argument was one big, big argument to make pressure, of course, on the workforce in Poland and Hungary. But uh, we made researches also in China even China is not a stable entity. Even in China, we have this competition between um, the East Coast and the inner country. So the arguments are all the time, all the, time the same. We need to have, we have more flexibility, we need to have more cost advantages, and so there is a relocation from the coast to the inner country, but also relocation from China to Vietnam. And uh, just to mention it, uh, um, uh, I have been, or I was in Tunisia after this um, so-called Arabian Spring, and there 
We have uh, European transnational corporations from Germany, once again, um, France and Italy. And after the social demands which came up in that Arab Spring, I know you know what I'm, I'm talking about, uh, those enterprises um, argued to go to Eastern Europe once again because they cannot stand the social demands. They would not be acceptable due to their own competition situation. So there's a whole really worldwide competition dynamic between nations, but also, as I said, within nations. To, to sum up the internalization of competition, because in, in the logic, of course, this competition is an enterprise competition for profit, but people, as they, are, they need to have jobs, they internalize it in a certain manner, um, the logic of economic competition via social differences is perceived among us, I really would say, as deep competition between different sorts of workforce. And we have it on all levels, local, um, national, regional, transnational, continental, and so on. So to come to the third point, what, what has this transnational cooperation thing to do with the German model? In our, no, in my country, not in our, in my country here, um, it is a bit funny because we also have a debate about the German model, but from the other side, let's say. Since the very beginning of the 90s, there's a huge debate and a very strong and, and, and aggressive, ag aggressive debate about the need to defend our economic German attractiveness, arguing that as we now have all those cheap labor around, this is not good um, because then we can have competition from there and so we have to adapt. And so there's a whole debate since that time about deregulation of collective bargaining, which uh, took place in a dramatic way um, to opt out of collective bargaining today is usual. It is officially, we do have collective bargaining, but it is a really normal case to opt out in the enterprise to say, no, we cannot stand this um, uh, contract uh, of wages, for instance, because our enterprise or our site is in such an economic situation that it is not possible to sign it. Um, it is, there's a huge debate about uh, reducing costs and also to create a low-cost sector. The argument here was to say that we need this low-cost sector because we need to have flexibility in wages and so on and so on. And what took place in enterprises especially, um, a lot of so-called, I don't know if you get this idea, but the so-called alliances to defend productivity and to defend production side and to defend the enterprise. So we have many cases, and it was really regularly, that to give one example, Nokia, you know, this former good standing mobile phone, uh, Nokia production in Bochum, which is a town in West Germany, as many, many others were threatened um, with closure and relocation to Romania and Hungary. And uh, so the um, union, together with the Works Council, made in such an ally alliances, oh yes, France, alliance, alliances, and so uh, from their side, they offered to reduce wages, to, to offer more flexibility from union side, and in this way to um, compete with the Romanian and Hungarian option of production over there. So we call this alliances to defend productivity. In Germany it is Bündnis für Arbeit, if someone... Um, of course, if, as you can imagine, uh, due to that, um, to that development, we have in Germany a strong uprising of the use of atypic precarious workforces in enterprises. We also had, what I will not go into details here, a deregulation of labor law, um, in the beginning of the new millennium, by the way, uh, it was 
done by social democratic um, government. So we have now the possibility of unlimited uh, agency work, of unlimited um, contracts, of temporary work, and so on. But what I want to say here in the final uh, last slides is that this creation of a precarious, low-paid um, sector uh, of workforce in Germany was directly a political thing too. You, you mentioned, uh, Maya, that this, of course the state is an actor in that, or that uh, game. And we had this actor in uh, 2003, uh, or not we had this actor, but then <laughs> it became especially important, with the implementation of, cheap, of deep changes in the social welfare system, we call it Hartz IV, and I think anybody who has been to Germany know this term, because it's really since one of the famous and, and common uh, uh, terms people use uh, in everyday language. This Haas fear comes from a name. It is uh, Peter Haas, which, by the way, was a former HR director of the famous co-determination enterprise Volkswagen. And the idea of Haas fear is to um, uh, link social aid when you are unemployed um, to reuse it and uh, to link it, I will come back to that, uh, to special um, needs. So, to s I will talk a bit about this hard sphere thing. The sum you have today when you get social aid, um, so this means when you are unemployed longer than one year in general, is 350 euro in west and 334 in east. So you see there's still a division, with, even if it is not that important, but it exists. Um, and it is the state, or better to say the community, who um, pays accommodation. But as I will argue later, this is not that easy. And what is important here to notice is that this level, first, it is not much. I don't know if you are a bit familiar about um, accommodation prices, uh, um, um, costs and so on in Germany, but this is something really hard to live on, really very hard to live on. And what is the most important, this level is not fixed. So you cannot calculate with the sum of money saying, okay, I will stay a poor person maybe, but I will be fine because I have someone in the family, or I have a flat which is not that um, expensive, or I even have some black, um, uh, black labor to do, or some, I, I'm, I could try, you cannot do this, because there's a whole system of control uh, introduced with these uh, reforms, controlling, for example, the family, if there's someone who earns a bit more money and then he has to pay for you, including partners, um, of course personal savings if you had a good job and you put money besides is uh, taken uh, first, you have to, to, to take it first. Um, what is controlled also is if you are working besides and you earn some money and so on. And this is this goes very wide, uh, very um, far because um, for instance, in Leipzig, which is a town in East Germany, those state agency people um, visited communities, visited people who are living together, students, and they controlled the teeth brush uh, to, to find out if there's someone who is a partner. And uh, if they found someone being a partner, they reduced money. So this is a whole controlling system. This is the first point. The second point is, that this amount of money is very easy to reduce if you do not really fulfill uh, tons of paper and do not give all the information they want, and which is sometimes very complicated because the bureaucrats have complicated uh, papers and so on, and it's not easy, really not easy to, to, to make it, especially for migrants, by the way, but this is even another story. Um, there's re reduction. There's reduction, of course, also to punish if you do not obey to what they demand. And what is important here is uh, that there's a system of one-way communication. So your 
how to say, your, your responsible person in that agency can contact you and uh, you have to be contactable all the time, but you cannot contact him or he, she. And this led to really uh, a dramatic situation. I, I, I don't know if um, we had a process in Frankfurt where I live right now, I come from Berlin, but uh, I live in Frankfurt right now, where a person which, uh, as we found out after then, really had nothing to, not, not enough to eat the days before, and she killed one of the agency persons because uh, she was so in stress that she got no help uh, from, that, from that agency. So the, the situation often for people is very dramatic. Another point is that um, there are the judges, uh, there are tons of, of um, yeah. how to say, Beschwerden claims, I think. What is Beschwerden? Do you know that? Um, uh, process so uh, started from the people arguing that it is not just how the agency is acting and uh, the judges are not quick enough, so they are behind uh, of three years right now. So when uh, uh, you had uh, three years of nothing to eat, you maybe have the chance that the judge will say this officially to you. Um, and as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, this hard sphere system is thought to be that the state or the community is uh, um, the lender, how we say in Germany, pays the flat, but uh, they argue now that the flat has not to be too big for you. So in every community there are different restrictions of the size of the flat, different restrictions which changes all the time. And we have um, forced evictions of people, of poor people, um, in Berlin, for example, we have uh, 6,070, even more, uh, in 2011, which is uh, 22 per day. And this is not an exception. This is taking place also in other towns. Um, what was achieved by those reforms is we call it in science, I don't know if you know this um, term, this expression, system of activation. The idea was that people should not repose even on a low level of reproduction, but they should be activated all the time. Um, activated means that uh, you have to take every job this agency is offering to you, even if it is very low paid, it, and I will come back to the, to the payment. You have to accept trainings, um, and even if there are other regions, and right now there's a debate also if there are somehow in other countries next to Germany. And I don't have to repeat this. Um, officially, the unemployment uh, number of unemployed number of people, number of unemployed today is something like eight percent. And with all those calculations, you see that this is not the real figure. But I don't want to go into this on that. But I want to say is that due to that huge pressure on wages, because of the creation of this low cost sector, we have in now today uh, enormous uh, low paid work sector which is uh, near to 24% of the whole workforce which is more than Great Britain has. It is Germany in Europe on the top of the low paid people and in this sector of, uh, of the workforce we do not find the majority of non-qualified people, as it is argued all the time in the official debate, saying that, okay, if you get a good education, then you have the better chances on the labor market, and of course poverty is a question of education. Poverty is not a question of education, this is what the figures say, and uh, we have 70% um, of well professionally educated people, and the number of high school and university qualifications is arising um, it is now up to 20% even. The average low payment, when we talk about low payment, this is per month net something like, like um, 850, 900 euro for one person without children and so on. But many people earn less 
and the average of low payment is six euro six, but this is gross, and so it is something like uh, four euro eighty or so net. But this is the average. So in the average of low payment. And in sectors like the haircutting sector, the um, security services of enterprises and buildings and so on, uh, low payment means something like uh, three, three or four euros. We have two million or even more than two million people who work on a very, I mean, regular basis, but they earn that less that they still got support from the agency to come up with this hard sphere sum, which is um, 350 euros. So we have two million and even more people who earn less than 350 euros per month, even if they go on a 40 hour week. We have part-time, I will not be that long anymore. We have part-time work in this atypical workforce also, which is uh, only to a small portion voluntary. We have, of course, some subcontracted work, agency work. We have temporary work, um, which is officially only uh, at 10% now, but uh, today every second employment is temporarily fixed. And we had, somebody spoke about that before, pseudo or um, false self-employment um, in the enterprises. And we have highly stated subsidized uh, low wage work. These are the famous one euro job, which are literally one euro job, and they are thought to be something like uh, when you are on hard sphere, as, you, as we say, you can earn something uh, um, on plus, so you can earn something with those one euro jobs um, besides. And this low wages, uh, especially the young one euro jobs, um, made, of course, a big pressure in the whole labor market, and especially the one euro jobs made this pressure in the former public sector. So, low cost sector made pressure. We, we have, uh, when we talk about the former public infrastructure like telecom transports, we, they are really the pioneers of deregulation. The telecom, I think, has something like 15 subsidies, uh, um, people working really next to each other with, with very, very different contracts on very different levels of wages. And uh, there's a whole pressure uh, to reduce cost uh, via those social competition. And, and I come back to this transnational cooperation idea, we have it in production. The low-cost sector became one very important um, point uh, of the huge enterprise slide, once again as an example, Volkswagen, where up to 2008, 30% of the workforce in this town I mentioned here was agency workforce. This Nokia Bochum example I already mentioned had 30% too. Today, I don't want to mention in the details here about the figures, but today it is even more the pseudo self-employment, which is um, the actual thing for enterprises. Um, and we have had a huge outsourcing of all what we call services now, canteen, security services, logistics, and so on, of these enterprises, with, as I mentioned, special low wages. Security service is one of the baddest uh, um, paid uh, branch. And so in those enterprises, oh, I'm sorry for that slide here. Um, in those enterprises, we observe huge and sharp tensions between what we call the core workforces and the outsiders, precarious workforces and so on. We have in Germany, also in the scientific uh, community, we have debates about fragmentation and dualization. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, speaks even about fractal unions, arguing, which is really a fact, that in that financial crisis in 2008, the unions, the metal union in this um, special example, protected the cause and organized redundancy of precarious workforce so they use also the union um, precarious workforce as a kind of a buffer. 
So what we find in this German, German model to, to sum up and to come to the end is a combination of still protected, uh, protected workforce, still also middle classes earning like teachers or something um, in the administration, some people in the administration, but right next to, enough, uh, to each other a growing sector of precarious and low paid work. Um, and it is the latter, oh, no, um, not the former, it shall, shall say, yeah, the former, it is the protected workforce which is isolated. The direction of development is not the enlargement of the good paid protected workforce, but it is vice versa that the good islands or the good sectors are more and more isolated. Somehow we speak about islands. So I conclude the logic of development is not generalization of wealth, homogenization, but enlarging of peripherization. And along that lines, I, I mentioned social fragmentation, polarization, and so on. This is, as I said, a transnational process which takes place on local, regional, national scale. It takes place in the very same enterprise, in the very same office uh, um, of production, and the very on the same table, we could, uh, we could say. And on the same time, it's taking place on a supranational scale. So we have, oh, this was quick, we have this um, logic of competition and what I wanted to present here is a gap between an official ideology arguing that we need all those precarious workforce flexibilization to finally achieve and arrive on a, a model with wealth for everybody. This is the official idea, this is the official logic. I repeat this valley of tears. We have to accept precarious workforce because after this valley of tears, we come up with this social good developed model. But we now really can say that this does not take place. What is capitalism now today is it is using differences, it is keeping and enlarging differences. And now I will finish. Thank you.